Hi, Lori. Thanks for being here. Hi, Claire. All right. So the lovely folks at ISTE gave me only 30 minutes to present this session, which I typically love to take about an hour to present. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into some content. But I would love it if you'd continue to say hello to each other in the chat and, and make those connections. We're going to use the chat for an activity today as well. So it's helpful to just be able to find that space. But let's go ahead and um, begin. I want to let you know that my name is Dr. Kristen Matson. Uh, I am typically joined by my partner, uh, my business partner, Dr. Leanne Lindsay. She could not be here today. Uh, but together, we are managing partners of a consulting uh, organization called Evolve. I am the author of two ISTE books, Digital You're Citizenship in Action and it Ethics like in a Digital World. Before, Lacey, can remember. you help with the mute all button? Because I'm not the moderator. Thank you. Lacey's our, Lacey's our moderator. Hi, Lacey. Thanks for volunteering. <laughs> um, I'm Unmute. There we go. My partner, Dr. Lee and Lindsay, could not be here today, but we are managing partners of um, a consulting group called Evolve. I'm the author of two ISTE books, Digital Citizenship in Action and Ethics in a Digital World. And together, Evolve has published a free digital citizenship curriculum framework um, that helps educators really scaffold digital citizenship skills from pre-K up through 12th grade. It's totally aligned to the ISTE standards, but we wanted to show people how those standards can grow from grade level to grade level. So that framework is completely free. We don't even ask for your email address to go get a copy of it. You can find it at teachdigsit.com. And if you're tweeting today, you can find our combined account at Digsit Doctors, and then Dr. Lindsay and I each have our own accounts as well. So we'd love to stay connected with you through this work. A couple of key points before we get started. This session is going to be full of ideas and it's going to go really fast and furious. But what I'd like for you to do is to try to take off your teacher hat where you're like, ah, I have to grab every idea and you're taking crazy notes and pictures and things. Don't worry about that. I am literally going to hand you every single resource at the end of the session. So just be in the moment and enjoy this time as a learner and as a digital citizen. Don't feel like you got to grab all the things with your teacher hat. You're going to see a lot of images in this session. Some are going to be appropriate for the people that you teach and work with. Some might be appropriate for older or younger audiences. The great part about this session isn't really the images, though. It's all the ideas for how to use them. And at the end of the session, your resources that I share include close to 900 curated images. So you're going to be able to literally take any activity I show you um, and plug and play the right images into that activity for your learners. These images are not ones that I own the copyright for, and I didn't want to muddy up my slides with all the sources. But again, I'm going to share all of that with you at the end. So you'll be able to go and find the original owners of those images as well. And this session is a fair use session. So if you get some great ideas, I would love for you to go and share them out with other people. And if you utilize some of these ideas in your classroom, you remix them and you make them better, share them back to me because I would love to um, share them back out into the world. So when we're talking about digital citizenship, you know the theme of the day is that we're moving beyond internet safety to really sort of empower learners with skills. But we also need to be thinking about how we can um, help our young people wrestle with some of the ethical issues that are bubbling up at the intersection of technology and humanity, how we can make them empathetic, and how we can build and grow those mindsets of a digital citizen as well. And images are a great way to do that. First and foremost, um, teachers have varying levels of skills when it comes to digital citizenship and varying levels of comfort when talking about these topics in the classroom. I've had teachers tell me, well, I don't know anything about TikTok. How am I supposed to talk to the kids about TikTok? Um, and the beauty of images is that the teacher gets to step out of that role of tech expert or digit expert, and they really get to take on the role of facilitator. 
Images are also great because they recognize and value student voice and they give young people an opportunity to share what's happening in their digital worlds and not just have to listen to um, necessarily like a canned lesson or something that the teacher has prepared for them. Images are great because they're super open ended. If you've ever gone to an, you know, an art museum with family and you're looking at things, you have certain images that you're drawn to other members of your family might like a, a particular sculpture it's because we bring our world experiences into that interpretation. And, um, you know, we are going to find pieces that we are drawn to because of the experiences we bring. I'm going to show you some examples today of how images can be cross curricular so we can do some of these activities and align them with the goals of our science, our social studies or our English curriculum. It doesn't just have to sit in an advisory or uh, a tech class. And then finally, images are really naturally differentiating. If I put the same image in front of a five year old that I do in front of a 15 year old, the depth of conversation is going to vary naturally just because of the life experiences that those young people have. So let's kick this off with uh, an opening activity and I'm gonna show you two ways to do it because when I'm in person with educators, kids, parents love these activities too. If I'm in person, I will put these three images on a screen like you see right now. And I will tell people that these three images are a representation of society's relationship to technology. And I'm working with younger kids, I might say these are three examples of a person's relationship with technology, keep it personal, but we're all grown ups here and we've got a lot of degrees between us. So we're gonna think big. Society's relationship with technology, three different representations. And in person, I say, I want you to pick the one that you think is the best representation. And if you think it's letter A, go stand in that corner of the room. And if it's letter B, go stand over there. And if it's letter C, go stand over there. And immediately what happens is people divide up almost evenly into the three corners of the room. Now I've had to do this activity virtually too, and we're gonna do it virtually today. What I'd like for you to do is to find your chat and you're gonna tell me, don't get ahead of me. <laughs> you're gonna tell me which image best represents society's relationship with technology. So you're gonna say A, B, or C, and then you are going to say why you think that. Now, before you hit enter, you're just gonna hold on, you're just gonna wait we're all going to hit enter at the exact same time. I heard about this at a conference last week. Somebody called it a Zoom waterfall, and I thought that was kind of cool. So go ahead and type in the chat. Do you like A, B, or C, and Y? Don't, no, don't hit enter yet. A, B, C, or and Y. You got to give me the Y. Give me a couple of, of, of words or a sentence for Y. We're all going to hit enter at the same time. So type your answer and then just Hold on to your finger. <laughs> Don't hit that enter key just yet. I'm going to type mine in too. Don't hit enter. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> everybody's into hitting enter. I think sometimes it's just a habit, right? It's just a habit when we're done typing. All right, go ahead and hit enter. Everybody's cheating anyway. <laughs> Feel free to scroll back through that chat and see what others have to say. Um, in this very fast scroll, I'm seeing a little bit of everything, A, B, and C. Uh, C, I feel like we live in a time where we live through the screen and experience life through it. B, we're moving forward. We keep searching for more. A, the internet can connect us to the world, and yet we're still a little bit tethered, right? Can't fully get into the world. <laughs> C, 
to be fair, I've never tried the Zoom waterfall with 149 participants. So we were all learning together. <laughs> all right, so in this activity, what we see is people having very different perceptions of, of what society's relationship to technology is. And none of the answers that you put in the chat are right or are wrong. We're all bringing our own experiences to our decision. And we're all able to sort of justify our thinking with some examples and some reasons. And I will typically let people talk to others who chose the same image that they do for a few minutes. And then I will have them switch and go find someone to talk to who chose a different picture than them so that they can hear a different interpretation. I always start with an activity like this one because I like to let students, teachers, parents know that as we're having these digital citizenship conversations, we're gonna run into a lot of um, times where there isn't a single right answer. Uh, what might work in my home with my children may not work in your home with your children. I have three kids. Sometimes what works with kid A doesn't even work with kid B, right? So we have to value the lived experiences of everyone in the room. And we have to be willing to, to be open and to listen. So this is a great activity to just set the stage for the discussions that are to come. Now, the first time that I utilized images with students was with a sophomore health teacher who had approached me uh, just saying, you know, Kristen, I've always had this unit called healthy relationships where we talk about friendships and dating relationships, and we've never had any component of technology inside of the healthy relationships unit, and I think it's really important for it to be there. And I said, yeah, I think you're right. So together, she and I created a gallery walk activity. And two of the images that you see on the screen now are ones that we utilized with students. We ended, we chose like 10 that were around a similar theme of how technology sort of intersects with our relationships, especially as young adults. So the gallery walk kind of looks like this. In person, I'll print giant uh, images and hang them all around the room in a circle and I'll send kids around in pairs or adults in pairs with a notebook and they're just kind of taking some notes and having some discussion on these questions. There's always a uh, an initial analysis question. What What's the artist trying to say here? What do, what do you think this means? Let's just interpret it, right? The second question is about your personal opinion. Do you agree or disagree with this message? And then finally, can I make any sort of connections to it? And those can be personal connections. They can be connections based on friends or family, things they've read or seen in the news. But the beauty in this activity, is, especially for sophomores in high school, right, who wouldn't necessarily wanna raise their hand and say, yeah, I have felt like those three girls before. I've, I've been there. But they don't have to say that when they get to talk about those three girls. They don't have to uh, necessarily share their personal experiences when they're talking about what they see in the art. And so there's some beauty in that. Now, if I were to do this session virtually, I have the exact same activity, but instead of people walking around the room seeing the pictures hanging, I just show the picture on my screen for, you know, an indeterminate amount of minutes. And then I flip to the next one and I give participants a chance to sort of answer those three questions for themselves. And again, we only have a half hour today. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you lots of ideas, but we're not gonna get to practice them, okay? All right, so we look at all these images and then virtually, I will tell people, okay, you just saw six images. You've had a chance to think through those images on your own. And what I would like for you to do now is choose the image that is one that is just most intriguing to you. It's one that you really wanna go have a conversation with someone else about. And virtually I would say, all right, I'm gonna open up six breakout rooms. I'm not doing that for real, we don't have the time. But I would say, I'm gonna open up six breakout rooms and you're gonna choose which room you wanna go into. And so everybody in room three is able to have a discussion around picture three. Everybody in room five is able to have a discussion around um, picture five. And what I send to folks in the breakout room 
It's just a really simple Google Doc that I'll put in the chat. Yeah, Rachel, I think it's Rachel. I've got all the resources that I'll share with you at the end. I give people just a really simple Google Doc that has all the images that they just looked at and the questions that I want them to talk about in their small group. Now, when I do this in person, I don't have to send people to breakout rooms, right? I can just say, go stand by the picture that spoke most to you. And we're gonna have some conversation for a few minutes. So here's the questions that I want people to think about when I'm working with adults. If I'm working with kids or parents, the questions might be different. But when I do professional development, I say, yeah, go stand by the picture that spoke most to you. And I want you to talk about, you know, why was this image intriguing to you? But second, how might this theme or the messages in this picture be woven into your digital citizenship lessons? Have we missed anything when we talk about our digital citizenship curriculum? Um, are, there, are there holes we haven't thought about that these images maybe have inspired? And then I love asking teachers and parents, but you could also ask students to do this too. Uh, you know, think about your parents. How might they interpret this image differently from you? Or think about your grandparents. What might they say that's different from your own? So it's an opportunity to practice personal reflection, but also that empathy and perspective taking as well. So gallery walks can be a nice, easy way to get people talking without a whole lot of preparation on your part. Now, I also love finding images that I can bring into content area classrooms. This is one of my favorites. Uh, it is the singing of the Titanic remix because all of the people floating in the water are holding up a cell phone to film the Titanic as it is sinking. So I can imagine having a photograph like this as a bell ringer in say my middle school social studies classroom and have kids either type a response or handwrite a response to the questions I'm gonna show here as I'm taking attendance, collecting homework, uh, easy bell ringer activity, right? But I'm gonna tie it into some of the historical thinking work that I've been doing with my social studies students. First, it's always an interpretation question for me. What's the artist trying to say? And do you agree or disagree? So a nice opportunity for kids to just do some um, visual literacy, see if they can figure out what's going on in the picture and then give an opinion. But then we can start to tie it into content. So in a social studies classroom, I might ask a question like, how might our understanding of historical events be different if cell phones always existed? Whose perspectives might we have? Whose stories might be told? Uh, what you know, things might we know? And then because I'm a librarian and I'm always talking to kids about sources, I like to get them thinking about the fact that primary sources aren't always yellowed pieces of paper or old you know, black and white silent films that future generations are gonna learn from us because we are capturing primary sources every single day. It's a little scary. <laughs> I don't know what they'd have to say about my own middle schoolers. All right, we can tie this into other content areas as well. Uh, having been a high school librarian, I supported a lot of English language arts classes and read a lot of really dense old literature and practiced skills with students like illusion. And illusion is where we have a piece of literature, art, music, whatever, that is using the background knowledge of some other piece of art, music, literature, or whatever to make a point. And students always struggled because a lot of illusion alludes to things in the Bible, and students don't necessarily have that background knowledge uh, to make those connections. So I saw this image, and I immediately thought about a couple of uh, biblical allusions and Bible verses. And so I pulled two Bible verses and I thought what a great bell ringer to get students practicing making those connections uh, for allusions. So I might say, choose which of these two Bible verses do you think would be a better caption for this image and why? Support your reasoning, right? Just like we would with Common Core. And then I might ask, you know, a few more personal questions like, when you're on social media, are you the raven? Are you the skull? 
are you the person who's just sitting back, like watching it all go down? Um, you know, if, if the Facebook logo isn't representative of you, what logo might be there instead? So again, some deeper thinking, letting our um, students practice those skills of illusion, but through a digital citizenship image instead. I found these and I absolutely love them because again, it's relying on our knowledge of other pieces of literature to do that visual interpretation. So what do I know about Pinocchio that makes that image so hilarious? Well, clearly when he lies, his nose grows. And so what is the artist trying to say about the use of his nose as a selfie stick? Um, why is Snow White's apple have the Instagram logo on it? Do you ever feel tempted by social media? Um, why is Romeo offering Juliet a like instead of uh, a piece of poetry? So lots of ways to connect that, that prior knowledge, technology, make those personal connections. And I also think it would be really, really fun to encourage students to create art like this of their own as well. All right, I've presented this session in lots of different places and I always say if you come up with a cool idea, share it back with me. So I've had teachers reach out and say I'm just doing a daily caption this activity with my kids. They sit down, they have a notebook where they're keeping their captions and I just do an image of the day and they write a caption. I'm like, hey, I love it. Super easy way to get kids thinking about tech. Really easy check for the teacher to be able to see you know, what students' experiences are, great summarization practice, awesome writing practice, and a super low lift for you as a teacher. This one confuses me. I always put it out in the world just to see if anybody can come up with anything awesome. I'm like, somebody please write a great caption for this. Um, I used it in an in-person session last week and everybody kind of just sat and we couldn't come up with anything awesome. So if you have anything great, definitely share a caption. The best I can come up with is, don't be jelly that I have the new iPhone and you don't, which is not even a great caption. <laughs> All right, I've had some teachers to, oh, not my jam, I like that, I like that. I've had some teachers say, I can take, I've taken these images and put them in slide decks like this one and added things like thought bubbles or, um, you know, caption boxes, or I've turned some of the images into uh, like comic pages to help my kids practice writing, writing dialogue, writing, um, you know, titles and things like that. So this one is just, I just added a thought bubble on, on uh, Google Slides. This one, I added a thought bubble and a speech bubble. I also thought a really great writing activity for kids could be to use these images. I'm a librarian, so I, my mind always goes to writing and reading. Um, but to go into my classroom and say, look at this great new picture book I got. Look at the cover of this book. Aren't you excited to read it? What do you think the back of the book says? What do you think this book is all about? And have the kids write a back of the book summary that could be the plot to this story. Uh, this could also be a movie poster, right? Create a movie trailer that gets me excited to go watch this movie. Um, alternatively, I used to read short stories with my kids and make them put the, uh, put the pieces of the story on a plot diagram. Why not just give them a blank plot diagram and an image and say, you tell me what's the conflict, what's the rising action gonna be? Um, really cool ways to be creative around just that daily life of technology. Here's one that I thought might be cool for high school social studies kiddos. Very back to the future. Yeah, you're gonna get a link with over 900 images at the end of the session. I promise, promise, promise. All right, I love doing these in small ways. They don't always have to be huge, big activities. Um, one of my favorite activities to use images with, again, is just bell ringer stuff. So for this bell ringer, I have everybody get out a sheet of paper and I say, number your paper one to five, and we're gonna do a silent activity. 
silent discussion activity. And the entire discussion will be around this picture. So if you want to try it along with me, you're welcome to, or maybe just think it in your, in your brain. On line number one on your piece of paper, I want you to finish this sentence. So look at the picture, write the words I noticed and finish the sentence. Tell me something that you noticed. If you wanna throw yours in the chat, go ahead. I'm gonna put mine on my paper. Uh, I noticed I noticed three guys walking away from the camera in bright yellow hoodies. I bet not all of you saw those three guys in the bright yellow hoodies. Okay, but I wrote it on my paper. Then for the activity, I say, okay, everybody take your paper and pass it to the person sitting behind you. And now I have a new paper in front of me. Maybe it's Lacey's paper. And I go, oh, wow. Lacey noticed uh, that everybody had numbers over their heads. I was so busy looking at those bright yellow hoodies. I didn't even notice. So now I have my thoughts about what I noticed. I also have Lacey's thoughts because I got to see her paper. Um, and now I have Lacey's paper and I'm gonna do number two, I wonder. And I'm just gonna write my wonderings about the image right under uh, Lacey's number one there. I'm gonna write my wonderings on number two. I wonder, I wonder where this is too. I wonder where this is. So everybody writes their I wonder. And then we do it again. We pass the papers back. And now I've got a couple people's ideas. And I'm holding another paper that I haven't seen before. And I have to fill out number three. I think this means, so again, a good just like visual interpretation question. What's going on here? What's the artist trying to say type of a question? And then we pass papers again. And number four is I would title this. I love forcing kids, <laughs> forcing, I love encouraging children <laughs> to write titles or to write um, captions because it's just really good summarization activity. Do a six word summary of what's going on here or give me a two word title. And then no matter how many prompts I give, if I give three prompts or 10 prompts. My last prompt is always a final thought because it doesn't matter what sorts of questions I ask. Inevitably, some genius child has something way more important to say than my prompt could tease out of them. And so the final thought is a place for them to write whatever they'd like. Um, I've used this for writing and perspective practice as well. Oh, I gotta watch my time. Uh, writing and perspective practice. So let's pretend 150 man, um, bumps into 320 guy and they have a, a an exchange. What might that dialogue look like? And we can practice uh, punctuation of dialogue in that way. All right, I gotta speed through these. Um, I love using these pictures with games that kids are familiar with, specifically games like Would You Rather? And I've written a whole bunch just because the images have inspired me to write them. But I could also see giving kids a bunch of pictures and telling them to write the would you rather prompts. So you can write prompts or the kids can answer prompts that you have written. But again, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just that opportunity to kind of play around in the gray a little bit and figure out what would be the pros and cons of both of these things. I swear I wrote this would you rather before the pandemic. I swear I did. <laughs> And my answer has changed since then too. So another one, would you rather own a robot dog or a real dog? And then I actually have a link for you that I'm gonna put in the chat. And this is in the final resources as well. But I actually have 50 digital citizenship would you rather prompts. And um, if you throw your email in the box, it'll email 50 prompts to you. And they're already on like really nice one pagers that you can display up on your board. All right, let's keep going. I don't have enough time. I never only talk for a half an hour. All right, last thing I want to show you are these resource cards. These resource cards are gonna be in your resources too. It's just a baggie. And the activity is a sorting activity. So every card has a different image on the front and every card has different words on the back. 
And in person, it works really well to just give a group a baggie for four kids in a group. Put the cards all out on the table, sort your cards into groups of your own choosing and assign your group a category name. Doesn't matter what the category name is, you just gotta give them one. And the truth of the matter is folks, it doesn't matter how many categories they come up with. It doesn't matter what they label the categories. The beauty is all in the discussion that happens as people are trying to create those, uh, those groupings. Now during COVID, and if you teach virtually, I ended up doing this on Google Jamboard, where I just put together uh, like a Google Doc with a whole bunch of Jamboard links on it. And I said, all right, no matter what group you end up in, that's the Jamboard you're gonna grab. And then people are able to drag and drop the cards on the Jamboard and label them with the sticky notes. So there's ways to do it physically, and virtually and in your resources today is a pdf of all the cards that i've created so you can print them back to back cut them up and have your own sorting activity too all right we're out of time so let's get to the resources <laughs> here you go on my wakelet board wakelet.com slash at dr k masson you will find uh all the resources for this session. And you can also continue to connect with both Leanne and I at evolvelearning.com. That was a super fast half an hour, friends. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, let me just put the link to the Wakelet right in the chat in case you wanna click and go. There you are. Thanks so much for being awesome participants. This is the one you want right here. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye.